Let us approach the throne of God, the one who wishes us to bear good fruit, as we seek to abide in Christ and he in us. Come, let us worship our Heavenly Father together. Let us pray. Father Almighty, we come once again to be enlightened by the wisdom of your Spirit as we endeavor to live lives of usefulness to you and to one another. Open for us the gates of righteousness as we follow your Son who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading of Psalm 22, verses 25 through 31. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him, future generations will be told about the Lord, and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. We remember in our personal prayers this morning, Nancy Keefe, Penny Putnam, Pastor Hazard, Thomas Matthews, Tom Virgo and his wife Elizabeth and their family, Cindy D'Andrea, Judy Zuliani, Jim and Joan Burke, Nicole Siriello, Perry Green, Fred Paris, Glenn Wynn, Finn Daly, Kayla Daly, Daniela and Matteo Siriello, living with a rare blood disorder, and their parents and all medical staff devoting their lives to helping children, all who are afflicted with and by the virus, all innocents caught up in war. Let us pray. Lord God, we return to you once again, not only with our daily concerns, but also with our eternal questions, knowing that even seemingly trivial anxieties are important to you, for you wish us calm, peace, and comfort. As we seek your presence when we kneel in prayer, we ask that we might be ever more open to the movement of the Holy Spirit within us, filling us, penetrating us to the uttermost core of our being. We wish to become attuned more thoroughly to the divine accent, resonating in our hearts to the sounds of the angelic hosts, offering you praise and thanks. And for those times, O God, when distractions cause us to forget our dependence upon you, we ask for the strength to return to you once again, so that our perception might be filled only by the vision of your majesty and glory. Heavenly Father, we would pray not only for ourselves, but for all those who had a hand in bringing us to this place in this moment, for family members and friends who nurtured us in the faith, for Sunday school teachers who instructed us in your ways, for authors who use their craft and their skills to communicate the gospel, for choir directors and church musicians who paint visions in sound, speaking of your glory. We would also pray, O oh Father, for others who have played a role in the spread of the faith, for translators of the scriptures, for missionaries who feed the physically hungry, who teach those who have hungered and thirsted after righteousness, and who heal those whose afflictions, whether spiritual, emotional, or physical, have laid them low. We also offer up prayers, O God, 
for those facing hospice care, that your comfort and relief might accompany them in their journey through the Valley of the Shadow. We likewise offer our heartfelt compassion and concern to those who mourn and to those who grieve in the face of losing a loved one, knowing that Christ himself came to console and to relieve those who are in distress. Indeed, we pray for the grace to be more like Christ as we strive to emulate his example in serving the creation for which we pray in his name. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 15, the first eight verses. These are the words of Christ. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Here end the morning scripture lessons. It would appear that we are now approaching the final stages of the pandemic here in the United States, even if in places like Cuba, Brazil, and India, the scourge rages on. 
We can only hope and pray that whatever measure of divine grace accompanied our survival of the past 15 months or so would be accorded to those persons, communities, and nations which still have a long way to go before coming out on the other side. And to the extent that we can, as Christians, participate in their full recovery, we pray that we would take to heart the admonition of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatians, thought by many to be the earliest composition of Christian scripture, where the Apostle writes that we are to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Even well before many of us began to hope against hope that there was light at the end of the proverbial tunnel in this time of pandemic, we became aware of how our lives had been altered because of the isolation brought about by quarantines and lockdowns. As part of our shared history as Americans, we are told that it was rugged individualism that helped us carve out a nation in the wilderness. There is, however, much more to the American character than merely a sense of being able to go it alone. In fact, the church has repeatedly warned that separation from one another and from the world itself often comes at a price that we should hesitate to embrace. And that is one of the lessons from the allegory which Jesus presents to his disciples in the 15th chapter of John's Gospel, when he says to us, I am the vine and you are the branches. It shouldn't surprise us that grapevines are the most common plant mentioned in the Bible. In the scriptures, the vineyard often represents the people of God whether they were the children of Israel or the church. The scriptural image is not always flattering, to be sure. Isaiah chapter 5 is particularly troubling. But it should come as no surprise that when Jesus introduces his teachings here in John 15, as part of his farewell to his disciples in the upper room, where the Last Supper would soon be celebrated, the image of the grapevine begins with an often forgotten truth. Christ may be the vine, and the church makes up the branches, but we should not forget that it is God the Father who is the vine dresser, cutting away those parts of the community that are unproductive, pruning those branches that no longer bear fruit, in order to throw them into the fire. But perhaps that is a sermon for another time. Throughout John's Gospel, Christ goes out of his way numerous times to tell us just who he is. In fact, this last Sunday, we heard that Jesus said that he was the door or the gate of the sheep. Just a few verses after he had said, I am the good shepherd. Elsewhere in John's gospel, Jesus tells us, and I quote, I am the bread of life, and I am the light of the world, and I am the resurrection, as well as the most famous of all these statements, beginning with the phrase, I am, in chapter 14, where Jesus informs us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But as we considered last Sunday, Jesus only talks about himself in order to focus on us as his followers and his disciples. And in talking about the vine and the branches, Jesus is reminding us that in isolation from him, and from one another, we lose our own self-identity, our sense of purpose, and our very reason for being. No wonder so many of us had difficulties 
in being cut off from family and friends during the pandemic. We were created to be in relationships with each other. We are made to serve, to minister, and in the words of the Apostle Paul once again, to bear one another's burdens. Because our burdens are sometimes so weighty that we cannot always carry them alone. Paul reminds us comfortingly that we need not carry them alone. There is an old story which many of you have probably already heard about the parishioner who gradually stopped coming to Sunday worship. So the minister called upon this member of the congregation not to berate him or to abrade him or to guilt him into returning to the fold. In fact, the minister said nothing at all when he came in through the door. The minister simply sat opposite his old friend by the fire and then in silence took the set of fire tongs hanging by the hearth. With them, the minister plucked one of the burning coals and removed it from the flames, setting it on the edge of the fireplace. Slowly, what had once been a brilliantly burning red coal cooled until it turned cold, no longer giving off any heat. Then, without further comment, the minister took the tongs once again to return the dead coal to the center of the fire, where it came back to life, glowing red. Then the minister got up and silently left. Sure enough, the wayward parishioner was back in the pews the next Sunday. That is part of what has made the last 15 months so difficult for so many of us. There have not always been pews to return to, and we yearn to return to the warmth of familiar faces, friendly surroundings, beautiful strains from the organ, and the sound of voices from a congregation lifted up in praise and thanksgiving. But it's hard when we are separated from one another, for we are meant to be interconnected, not just spiritually, but also physically. For we are the branches of the vine, and as such, we are the ones whose job it is to bear the harvest. The cause of Christ, if it is to be spread, must spread through you and through me. And for the successful completion of our task, we depend upon the vine dresser, the vine keeper, the vine grower, none other than God, the Father himself, who tends us, feeds us, coaxes us toward fruitfulness through the bounties of his divine grace, a grace that is ample, that is generous, that is ungrudging and is lavish. For as Luke's gospel reminds us, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Everything the branches require, the vine and the vine dresser provide that the kingdom might be one. So let us come now to the table where Christ himself provides, knowing that the means of grace are found here in relationship to one another, in service to the kingdom. Amen.
Please join me in our unison communion prayer. Forgiving God, remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup to joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. This we pray in the name of your Son. Amen. For on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. After he blessed it, he broke it to share it with his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he then took the cup to share that as well with his disciples, saying, this is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Drink you all from this cup and do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray together our unison communion prayer of thanksgiving. Because the broken bread has meant our healing, because the outpoured cup has meant our life, because our common sharing has meant the communion of our souls, and because we have here been graced by your presence, we give you thanks, O God, and pray that our lives be renewed in the life and love of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us and in our homes and with our loved ones now and forevermore. Amen.